Hi everyone and thank you for joining us tonight. I warn you, I'm going to cry. You can hear it in my voice already. Before we start, I'm just going to do one simple thing, which is to light a candle. I will light a candle, do the big jump. It doesn't want it to light. It's hard to do. This is to represent every one of us, everyone here, everyone in our community. I'm not going to say any more for now. I'm just going to put it to the side. This is the point where I always ask everybody to introduce themselves. And I'm going to do that now, but it's going to have a bit of a difference. And it's only for everybody to say what they feel comfortable with or to say they don't want to say anything at all because I'm gonna ask you one by one to introduce yourself as if you were the mother you dreamt of being. So can I ask you, Lana, to go first for us, please? Thank you, Steph. Um, and yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks for organizing everything. You are amazing. And let those tears come out, let them, yeah, embrace them. Hi, everyone, I'm Lana. Steph has just asked us to introduce us as a mum. So this will be the first time in my life I'll say, hi, I'm Lana. Uh, I'm a mum. I've got uh, two kids. It was a boy and a girl. Um, they're well behaved. Uh, they share the same interests as me. I'm busy um, running around doing things with them and for them, but I don't make them boss. Um, I love my kids. Um, <laughs> Steph said we might cry and and yes it's interesting that uh yeah there's a little bit of hesitancy hesitancy there um it's really interesting that I can see the gap between being a mum and being who I am now and actually Steph I think I prefer who I am now to a pretend mum wow and that's just come about just this 30 seconds of articulating that so yeah so I think I might leave it there for the moment um yeah, because it's really, really interesting. And even though I've done a lot of work, I can feel lots of things going on with that. So thank you for that exercise. And it's reinforced how, yeah, you can heal because I feel great as the woman that I am now. Thank you. Lucy, thank you. That's right. Lucy, would you like to come next, please? Hello. Hi, everyone. I'm Lucy. I live in London. I'm a full-time mum to two children and um, life is really hectic but full of love. Um, it's really hard work, really tiring, but I'm so happy and my children are my absolute world. That's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Victoria, did you wish to say something or do you want to hold back? No, oh, I'd like to pass. Thanks, That's Steph. Fine. But hello, everybody. I'm Victoria. And Kat, would you like to say something? Brilliant. Well, first off, Steph, thank you again for running World Childless Week. It's just amazing. And to all the panellists tonight and throughout the week, um, it's just the most incredible lineup of events and incredibly supportive. Um, so if I'd had children, I'd probably... Um, be oddly probably more put together than I am now I'd still have just had a hip replacement a couple of weeks ago but probably in panic made more of an effort so I'd probably have done my makeup and everything in case somebody thought that I was a mum who didn't have her stuff together which as we know is one of the worst things that uh, somebody can be um I always thought that I'd have like two maybe three kids uh, obviously blithely unaware of how much work it is to raise a child well and to undo the sins of the past if you like um and I'd, I'd probably feel relieved on one level because I'd feel like I was meeting my friends well some of my friends where they were rather than feeling sort of unbalanced um but you know there's a chance that actually I might still be feeling incredibly unbalanced because it was through discovering that I was never going to be able to have biological children, but I ended up discovering that I had combined type ADHD, which had completely 
informed every single one of the shopping list of mental health problems that I, you know, struggled with throughout my life. Thank you, Kat. I'd better say something. And I think, you know, I would have been a mum, a stay at home mum. With, I always thought the 2.4 children, those I don't know where the point four was coming from, but I envisioned having a girl and a boy. The girl was all this and a bit of a wild child and crazy and free. And the boy was full of laughter and love. And that's what I thought I would be. But obviously, none of us are mums. Our dreams didn't happen. They were blown out, they disappeared. Which is what brings us to this webinar and try to figure out who we are because we're not the person we imagined we were gonna be. So now we're gonna go around the room and introduce ourselves again as who we are, please. So again, if we'd like to start, Lana, I think you were first last time. If you'd like to come in first this time again. Hi everyone, I'm Lana. I am 53, I'm Australian. I've lived in the UK for 26 years. I've been on a great journey of discovery throughout my life emotionally. Um, uh, I don't have children, but what that's done um, after I grieved and really grieved and really grieved was that I started the healing process really, really tentatively. But what that's done over time and with healing of, of, of different forms, it's given me the opportunity, the space and the time and the money and the lack of tightness and the energy and the capacity to find out who I am, who I want to be, how I want to live my life, what kind of legacy I would like to leave if I need to leave any legacy. Um, so I spend my time working in a job that I love I retrained a few years ago. Um, I'm a massage therapist, emotional freedom techniques practitioner. So I feel like I finally found what I want to do when I grow up, um, which I don't think I would have had the opportunity to do if I'd had children. So I really spend my time focusing on me and my life because really that's all I've got. Of course, I have family and friends. And I, when I say I focus on myself, I don't do it in a completely selfish way but it is my life I haven't got somebody else's life to live like Steph just blew out that candle our dreams had gone but now we have got space and time and energy even though you might not feel like you've got that at the moment we actually have a huge gift of finding out what our life is about how we want to live our life whether that's on you know a very daily like whether we want to do five minutes yoga or 20 minutes yoga, whether it's on a, a bigger level, it doesn't matter. You've got the time and the space to live your life and find out who you want to be um, without the demands of motherhood. So that's who I am. And I now think, especially after COVID or during COVID, um, I was thinking, goodness, I'm so glad I haven't got children to homeschool. And I think depending where we are on our journey, some of us have going to have that thought. And even Thinking that thought for the first time can be, oh my goodness, I can't believe I thought that thought. But we are where we are, that candle has blown out, but that gives us space and time for other things. And we are able to embrace it. We are allowed to embrace it. We should, I don't normally like the word should, but you've got that time and space. You'll find a way to make that work for you in whatever way that is. Yeah. Sorry if I've got off topic a bit, but. Um, that's positive. who I am now. That's who I am now. It's yeah. all positive. And, and in, enjoying my life, which doesn't mean that there aren't negatives in loads of other areas for different. We all have ups and downs, but yeah, I've got space and time for me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Lucy, would you like to share next, please? Hi again. Um, I'd like to do a little bit of a twist on this. So I, when I introduced myself as a parent, um, I said that was a full-time mum with two children. Life is hectic, but full of love. And it's hard work, but I'm so happy. So I'm Lucy. I am married. 
I don't live in London. I live by the seaside on the south coast of England. And I have two cats and a dog. And I'm going to say the same things. Life is hectic, but full of love. And it's hard work, but I'm starting to find happiness and joy in my unexpected life my plan B. Um, I am childless due to infertility. I had several rounds of IVF in the UK and abroad. Sadly, that didn't result in me having a child. And it's, it's, um, it's been difficult. But where I am now is that I have been able to leave my life in London and move start to move forwards to move to the coast which is something I would never have done if I'd had children I would still be in London to be near family and I yeah I feel like I'm starting to embrace this new life I I always dreamed of being a mum but now I'm finding out more about myself and what makes me happy with that not being fulfilled. Um, I'm an illustrator and designer and part of my healing has been to create um, a range of greetings cards aimed at the childless not by choice community, which I do um, have here, which I'll just briefly show. But this came about um, wanting to support women and also to work through my own emotions and I also created a range of affirmation cards um, which is is some work that if I'd been a mum I would never have done this and I'm finding through my creativity I'm starting to embrace the things that this new life is bringing me and the connection to this amazing community that I'm that I feel so deeply. So that's me. Thank you, Steph. Thank you, Lucy. Victoria, would you like to share? Hi, I'm Victoria. Um, I'm 50. Um, I live in Yorkshire. I am a daughter and a sister and an aunt. Um, I'm going to go for legendary aunt, in fact. Um, I am a friend um, and I um, have a dog and two chickens uh, and I am a gym regular and I'm a five rhythms dancer and I'm a student Alexander Technique teacher. And I work in arts management, but I am also a theatre maker and a writer and I perform in my own work. And for me, that was a big thing that I made a deeper commitment to when I knew that I wasn't going to be a parent. Um, and that's brought me a great deal of um, fulfilment and I make predominantly autobiographical work. And so I made a show about my journey to knowing that I wasn't going to be a parent, uh, which has been a wonderful um, and surprising vehicle for me to talk more about my experience and to connect with this community, which is, um, has been a real privilege. Um, and something else that's happened over the last few years that I'm really aware of is that I was also a, a carer. I was an end of life carer for my mum. And I know sometimes, um, we're mindful that people without children might end up bearing a, a bigger brunt of fam family responsibilities like that. But for me, it was a personal choice of something that I really wanted to do. And um, I was really glad that I had the, the personal freedom to be able to do that in the way that I did. So that meant a lot to me. Thank you. Kat, would you like to share? Hello again, I'm Kat. I'm a writer and journalist in, living in South London. Um, obviously don't have children, but I left full-time office nine to five work shortly after I, my two IVF cycles failed due to um, unexplained infertility. And 
a year after that, during lockdown, heard that I wasn't going to be able to have children. But later that year, uh, put the clever velvet that I'd ordered our sofa in, allegedly so that, you know, kids could vomit over it and that sort of thing. And you can still put it through the washing machine and it'd be rescuable. Putting that to good use with my rescue retriever, Sybil, who is um, basically just asleep and uh, uh, will not do anything cute or useful. But it's that sedentary nature um, that means that we both qualified to do pets as therapy earlier this year. So um, we're just waiting for our DBS check to go through and then we'll be going into our local hospital and care homes and, and doing something that I'd wanted to do years ago since I'd heard about it, which is going into schools and helping shy children practice their reading. Because if they don't want to talk to an adult, then they can just practice reading to the dog, which is I just remember reading about in about 2008. I think they only did it with greyhounds then, retired greyhounds, and just thinking that was wonderful. Um, and I'm also an editor now, like a book editor, Earlier this year, um, I, with the help of the 780 plus people who pledged, uh, managed to crowdfund over £20,000 to make a book collecting people's stories, our stories of childlessness, baby loss, uh, being child free and changing your mind and choice um, into a book called No One Talks About This Stuff. Um, which is going to be published by Unbound and available, and this was hugely important to me, in regular bookshops uh, from about 2024. I didn't want it to be anything that you had to like send off in an A4 envelope stamped or whatever, or order off the internet. I wanted it to be real. And for me particularly, I didn't want it to be siloed because I was, after my IVF failed I couldn't couldn't talk to my friends about it so I just sent a tweet and in a sort of vaguely parasocial way I was just like it's probably not I'm probably never going to be a parent I just need somebody to tell me something nice because I just felt like I could not I felt like I was so radioactive I could not go to my friends because I was so worried that I would scorch earth them not even you know just just the parents or the non-parents but literally everybody I needed people that didn't really exist, if you like. And a few months after that, um, I stopped drinking and I started I started going to support meetings for giving up drinking. And that really informed my sense of this book because I didn't just want it to be for people of my experience, like white middle class, six foot one, red curly hair, has one dog, two cats, lives in South London, that sort of thing. Um, I wanted it to be a huge thing because once I was able to lift my head up a bit and look at events like the wave of light in October or every other awareness month around loss, stillbirth, miscarriage, be, uh, just being child, being child free, sorry, not just being child free, but you know, the people in the middle that always end up getting squashed by one way or the other. Um, and I wanted to make it a place in lieu of a support group because god no if any of you have tried to find a support group for anything to do with this it's impossible so i thought i want to make a support group in a book and it being a little bit informed by what i took from my recovery from booze which was when you're reading a story or listening to a story to listen to the similarities and not the differences because honestly even just now reading and editing the stories ready for to submit the manuscript to the line editor at the end of October. Oh my God, so many similarities leaping out for me personally in stories which just on the surface, there is no overlap whatsoever. Um, we also have a few men contributing to the book. And of course there's, I mean, we, I've tried to make it as intersectional as possible. And what I mean by that is it means that if it's a story about childlessness, it's never just about childlessness. Like for me, it was my relationship with my family. It was my then undiagnosed neurodivergence. It was my huge sense of ambivalence about becoming a parent in a society that loves people getting pregnant and giving birth and seems to hate people actually raising kids or heaven forfend when they become adults. So all of that sort of stuff really sort of shaken up into one book. And obviously, that's not something that I would do if I had children um, because I'd I'd be like, well, why? But speaking to the parents who are contributing to the book, it is something that never leaves you. 
And I think that's the other thing that I sort of wanted to pop that particular balloon, that nonsense of a happy ending, because certainly my ambition since I started being able to work through through what just seemed like tundral Antarctic of frozen awful grief was that you know life is basically one thing after another and like I said ADHD diagnosis giving up alcohol flipping hip replacement and then my hip replacement got infected that was grand so it, it is just that sort of thing it's just I didn't want to end up ruminating on the fact that I couldn't have children forever and so now in the last year, I've started babysitting for my army of nieces and nephews and even some friends' children and being able to enjoy them and especially being able to enjoy giving them back at the end. <laughs> so that's me for the time being. <laughs> Thank you, Kat. What I love is I can already hear like positives that you're bringing out about your life now. And Lana, you actually sort of said that, you know, your life now, you're sort of like loving it and think perhaps maybe it's better than what you could imagine if you've been a mother and we often hear mums say you know or they, they basically say they lose their identity because they're suddenly they're a mum and then nothing else and we lose our identity because we're not a mum but in a way it actually gives us the freedom to say well who are we and actually explore who we are and I'd love to open this up to everybody to sort of say who are we? What are the positives about us, whether it's to do with our personality, our work, um, our hobbies, what we're generally doing in life? And just try and focus on these positives that we've got, whether it's just personality or whether it's something we actually physically are doing. And I'd love it if anybody who's in the audience would also do the same sort of thing to add in the positives that they can see in themselves. And if you can't see it in yourself, can you see it in another childless person that you look up to or respect? So we can try and sort of brainstorm some of the good things that we do have that we forget about. But sometimes, you know, they slip to the back of our mind. Lana, would you like to start on that one? Yes, I mean, I mean, one aspect of this is, as, as I said, I, I retrained as a massage therapist three years ago. And when I was doing the training, um, there was a woman in the room um, who had a franchise for a pregnancy massage. Sorry, I do apologise for the trigger word, but it's part of the story um and I remember thinking oh, I'm never going to do pregnancy massage that's not for me I don't need to see pregnant clients you know it's like and I was really sorry I'm, I'm not I'm not stumbling over the emotion I think I've just swallowed some air the wrong way um and so anyway after a while um you know I retrained as a massage absolutely love it and someone came to me and said look I'm pregnant and I really want a massage I'm like, I really can't treat you um I ended up treating her um I researched what I should be doing and not doing and I couldn't believe that I was actually comfortable having a pregnant woman in my house because for years I had told my I'm never having anything to do with pregnant women you know it was the p word I couldn't even say pregnant and the upshot of this is that I retrained to specifically do pregnancy massages amongst all the other massages I do but it is a specialist skill I now have loads of pregnant women coming into my house, lying there. Um, I'm, you know, again, apologies if this is triggering anyone, but I am giving the nurture, the care, the love, the kindness that I have as my qualities. I'm giving that to the woman. And she's also a woman. She happens to be pregnant, but she's also a person. And I can massage her. I can make her feel relaxed. I love massage. So it's like, you know, give me bodies to massage. That's great. At first, I didn't really think about the baby because I don't massage on the abdomen and there's a towel over there. But I have to look at the breathing and I have to monitor what's going on. And after a while, I was actually, oh, what's going on? And I would then get feedback and they say, oh, the baby's loving this. And I thought, here I am. Like Kat said, she's babysitting. My family's all in Australia, so I don't have my nieces around me I have no contact with little people um, so the idea that I am giving some love some kindness some nurture even if it's just for a few minutes or an hour that I can you know use my talents my skills my love my caring to do this it's like what a fantastic outlet 
But three years ago, I never would have thought that was possible. And Kat referred to, oh, I don't believe in the happy ending. And I think it's really interesting because language and what we say um, is very powerful. So perhaps it's, it's the idea of right now, I can't see this or that, but things change, things change. So yeah, the person I am now, I have love, care and kindness, time and space and energy as well. Um, yes, yeah, so I find that very interesting that we go through this journey. I make no apologies for the J word because we do, and it isn't always linear. It can be all over the place, but then that gives you a chance to discover different things about yourself and about your life and what you thought you wanted compared to actually, do I want that anymore? Um, so it's, yeah, when you're ready for it, start putting a toe in the water of those things, whether it's creativity like Lucy, you know, Victoria's doing all sorts of things with her life, amazing, using her talents and skills. So um, the happy ending, someone's just popped in there, what is the happy ending? Happy ending doesn't have to be a child. Mm. Happy ending can be something else for you. Yeah, I think I'll leave it there because we've all got, you know, we all want to share. Um, but yeah, I hope that has, could help someone to know that, you know, it, you don't have to have everything sorted now, you know, but give yourself time and space. Mm -hmm. Does anyone jump, jump in or do I need to pick on you? <laughs> I can go. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, of course it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I feel like I know myself a lot better than if I'd been a parent. I think I would have been lost in that, you know, I'm a mum and it's all about my children and sort of lost myself within that. Um, so I do feel like I this has given me um the opportunity to really know and recognize the things that help me the things that make me happy the things that I want to focus on um I definitely feel like I have more empathy um obviously to childless women but also to just anyone in a difficult situation um anyone who might be misunderstood um so yes, I, I do feel that. I um I also feel like I've really been able to make really deep connections with people in within this community. And I guess as a parent, I would have made friends with other mums, but I just feel the connections that I've been able to make here is just such such a positive thing um in my life. And um yeah I've just I've been able to use my creativity which um I'm sure would have been pretty squashed if I'd had children I've 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 been able to let that come out and um also start um projects with childless women and yeah I I just feel that um there are loads of positives you can't you know I wouldn't have believed that through so I'm three years on from my last IVF cycle and I wouldn't have thought that I'd ever be talking like this but there definitely are positives mm -hmm. so yeah thank you thank you Go ahead, Victoria. I remember thinking I haven't got anything left to lose. I think my relationship broke down around the same time that I was not um, getting successfully pregnant. And I think I remember thinking that a lot of the things that I'd aspired to just, you know, just weren't happening. And, and the in the grief of that, there was, a, there was something helpful. I mean, it, it sounded a bit sabotaging at the time, like, you know everything's pointless but also from that I also had this sense of there's not much left to lose so I could take risks and for me um I'd always always my whole life since being in primary school you know wanted to be a, a performer or you know to to have some some kind of equivalent career and 
danced around the edge of it and in and out of it periodically, but was always a bit frightened really of doing that or of committing to it because of all the, the risks of failing or not being good at it or the personal exposure. And I was just like, there can't, there can't be a personal exposure worse than this in a way. And so I um, just, just decided to go for it. You know, I was like, what can go wrong that's not already gone wrong? And so there was something about the fallibility for me of having something not work out as you expected that that meant I could really reinvent something that I was passionate about um and I think it's you know we used to have a kind of social culture where people had a job for life you know your identity was something that was for life you know and you know I don't think that's how people live anymore you know we can you know, change careers, we can move and live in completely different places, you know, technology transforms things really fast. I think, you know, it's every, every life experience is just a chapter and chapters are one after another. Um, you know, as, as um, Lana, was, uh, no, sorry, uh, someone else was just saying earlier, and I, I think, yeah, it, you might want to grieve the end of, of this chapter or the end of this part of a story but there's always an, there's always another story to be had you know you're bringing up some re really interesting points between you all do you mean but cat before i sway us off somewhere else would you like to add to it yes in fact i've been so fascinated by what everybody's saying i've completely forgotten the question was it about the positives <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, so a really interesting sub question which came up in the q a about identification, specifically, eventually, at what point you identify as a childless woman, not by choice, as opposed to somebody who's trying to conceive. Um, I found that identity really useful for like the first year and a half, couple of years, whilst I was going through whatever on earth I was going through, um, because it meant that I found Jodie Day's book and then the Gateway Women community, um, and later found World Childless Week and found loads of amazing people on Instagram to follow. But I think one of the positives of not having children in this particular way for me was that it sort of, it, it was very much in keeping with experiences that I'd already had previously. And I had found that an excellent way to stop myself being stomped into the ground by social expectation was to speak up about them. So in about 2010, maybe just before, once all the conversation around depression specifically was coming up, um, I wrote a few pieces for um, places like Grazia and the Times Saturday magazine about my own experiences of depression. And like my my mum was absolutely horrified at the time. because She was like, this is just something that you just don't speak about. But then like her friends were starting to say, oh, I read Catherine's piece. Always Catherine, obviously, to my parents and their friends, never Kat. And um, oh, isn't it great? You know, so and so has this and blah, blah, blah has that. And it just sort of started this conversation. And so ever since then, my mum has sort of been like the barometer of like social opinion and stigma in that way. And so for me, a positive was being able to eventually sort of speak out in an authentic way once I was ready, not sort of trauma mining, not, you know, going through grief that I hadn't yet processed, but being able to say, I feel this way and I'm writing this because I can't flipping find anything else about it. And then oh my God, the people just come, which is wonderful. Like Twitter, on Instagram, on email. I mean, admittedly, some of them are absolute kooks. I had somebody recommending me Princess Diana's old acupuncturist or X, Y, and Z fertility ritual or something. And it was like, babe, literally tried everything. Tried acupuncture, tried science. It's just my body. Um, and so that has been kind of amazing because I think I grew up at a time when everything was so much on how you presented as a child and the expectation was to absolutely be the same as everybody else shut up and let people talk shit about you and how wonderful I'm just like as an adult I'm like no no thank you and if anybody does ask me 
any questions in a negative way, which it may just be my energy. It may just be my slightly chaotic aura. Very few perhaps because they're, you know, slightly scared of what will happen. But humor is usually what happens. And so if anybody asks me something ignorant or says something um, in a way that usually is well-meaning, I will be very honest about it. And I will judge it. So it's not like I'm immediately going slam dunk. Ha, ha, you dare be rude to me. I'll be rude back to you. Very, very polite. But just to be absolutely clear, this is just the situation. Like, would have loved to have kids. Harry and I can't have them. That sort of thing. Um, and uh, and yeah, so I think that has been a positive is that not not being well, I am too much. I have ADHD and I'm enormous and I have red hair, but but not hiding the things that are really important. I mean, fundamentally, that's the working title of my book. No one talks about this stuff. And we all know that people suffer when stigma is hidden and when people don't talk about it. And we can't just talk about this stuff after the event, the people that come out of the woodwork. It needs to be known. It needs to be known beforehand partly so that it helps people going through it, but also so that all of the other people who are going to inevitably go through it themselves in, you know, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, next week, next year, next decade, are going to have somewhere to go and to be able to find peace. And so for me, a huge positive of this is being able to do my bit just to make that little tiny borderline non-existent bookshelf of mainstream titles about childlessness and infertility and the fact you can have a flipping great life afterwards and you haven't just become less of a you less of a person because this one aspect of your life didn't come off as you expected that is so important to me that and animals and horse riding <laughs> i love that yeah i think it's like i'll use the word acceptance but obviously for a lot of people it's like oh my god i hate that word because we've all got different words that we connect to and ones that we just absolutely hate and we want to pass them on but for, for me i think it's not a case of accepting i'm childless it's accepting the child that will stay in my heart but will never be in my arms and accepting that oh, there might be triggers to the day i die but they'll never be as hard or as harsh and that i can deal with them so it's accepting the grief in my life but also accepting that i deserve to still be happy that I deserve all these new aspects and these new things to explore about my personality and where I go and who I meet and who I talk to. And like you say, because we punish ourselves so much and come up with all these reasons for why things didn't work out the way we wanted and criticize ourselves, it's accepting that the past is the past. And I think it's a really hard jump to do that but it's finding those little ways to move forward and find that acceptance of who you are now. Is there anything you could give as a, some, you know, some advice to people to sort of say, this is one little thing that helped me, or perhaps they could do this. <laughs> as soon as you just talk, Kat, though, I'll go over to Lana first. <laughs> yeah, I would say, because, you know, with, you know, the work that I do, fine with childless women one of the things that comes up is if I let go of the grief the guilt the sadness of not having children so that I can go and live this lovely life and find more of myself a lot of people struggle with the idea of but what does that mean to all those thoughts and feelings I've had for the last year five years ten years you know it, and it that's that's the grief playing that if I let go of my connection with my childlessness, am I getting rid of, you know, the love I had for wanting to be a mom or for the child that I never had. And I do say to people, you are allowed to let that go. Like you've just said, the past is the past. Letting go of the sadness, the heaviness is okay. You're allowed to do that because when you hold on to that, you're going to have less room for the positive, the creative, the theatre, the writing, all those things that you now have the opportunity for. And, you know, like we've just said, we're all um, perhaps a, a, a similar age. We're, we're not in our 30s. Um, and for women who are now in their 30s thinking, how can I possibly get through this? 
that actually you can. There are different ways and means, and it's all going to work in a different way, like um, Steph just said about different words, different language, but you are allowed to let go. So my my one thing would be don't feel guilty about letting go of any of that final grief. Let that blow that grief out like a candle when you've done all your grief work though don't go oh, I'm still grieving I'll just put it in a box don't do that you've got to grieve thoroughly I use the word thoroughly rather than because thoroughly will mean different things for people um yeah so you you don't need to hold on to the grief or the connection in a negative way so that that will give you the space then to have all these experiences and thoughts that we are having so if you can take heart from that I really hope that helps that's great thank you Lana Victoria you put your hand up yeah I just wanted to say something about the power of words really because you know we all have narratives that we attach to certain kinds of words so um, when Steph asked me to do this webinar um, and the day was moving on I was like yeah great I'm fine to talk about that and then I got the title of the webinar on the zoom link and it said acceptance and I was like whoa crap acceptance like that that, that word is not a word I feel cool with and, and I found it really challenging so it doesn't matter what you call it is what I want to say however you want to come to terms with or turn a page or reinvent or whatever it doesn't matter what you call it um you don't have to attain a certain kind of label mm -hmm. so I wanted to say that and it's sort of on the same lines really I want to respond it um in the chat to someone who was referred to as being selfish um because like that's a word that's got a really bad reputation and I, I think it's worth a word that's worth reclaiming um I work with with creatives on self-care and sometimes people struggle with that because they go from oh something about the self to being selfish and so I can't give myself permission for that and you know I'm entitled to have a strong sense of self you know I'm entitled to that you know and I'm entitled to do things that are my choice or that reinforce that so um yeah I just wanted to push back on the sense that there's selfishness attached to not having children or not adopting or just making choices because they please you. I think anybody who has found themselves to be childless not by choice has had a shit time in some form or another. And one of the first things that I think it's okay to do when you feel able is to do things that you want to do, you know, things that you want to indulge, things that bring you comfort, small joys, anything that you can find that raises a smile, like it, like it's totally fine to give yourself full permission. So I just, I really just, yeah, really, I was so cross when I saw that word in the chat. I just really wanted to come in with something about that. But don't you think really selfish is basically getting what you want? And if you wanted to be a mum and you became a mum, you got what you wanted. If you don't want children and you don't have children, you got what you wanted. But if you wanted children and didn't have them, we actually didn't get what we want. Mm. The logically selfish, like you say, there's so many aspects to that word. And I don't think it applies to us very often at all. But another thing. Lucy, did you want to add anything before I go back to Kat? Um, I think acceptance is... Um difficult um there isn't one thing you can do that will make will help you on your way to acceptance for me it's been a gradual process and I think the key things for me have been grieving getting counseling working through that grief and then connecting with the childless community in whatever capacity that might be so um, I did buy Jodie Day's book, Living the Life Unexpected, and that kind of set on, sat on the shelf for probably a few years. I, I think for me, starting to accept where I was and um, beginning to move forward onto more positive things has definitely been connecting with women who totally get it and um 
for me it was through gateway women which is now like the lighthouse women community and meeting up in real life or whether it's through social media um, messaging online it's all it's all really helped me to kind of accept this is where I am and to begin to move forward process what I've been through but start moving forwards to more positive things and like people have said I'm always going to have that child child that I wanted in my heart um but I feel like the the balance is shifting so it's like the positives about not having children now the positives about where I am I hold those in one hand and then in the other hand I still have the the sadness but it doesn't it doesn't come to the surface as much so it's kind of a constant balancing act but when you start accepting where you are then the grief kind of shifts down and the positives and your new life will um go upwards can't think of a better word than that um <laughs> yeah so that's what I'd like to say on the matter thank you go on Kat I know you're keen <laughs> oh no I, I love all of that uh, this was actually just prompted by somebody in the chat um uh, saying that um, somebody that they knew had been called selfish for not adopting, which, funny enough, is always something that seems to come from somebody who has not adopted anybody at all and seems to imagine that, like, adopting a kid is as easy as picking up some hot chocolate from Sainsbury's. Spoiler, absolutely not. Um, so I don't do this all the time, and I really think that this depends on where your emotional energy is at that moment. It... Like sometimes it's just easier to go. And in a sort of fairly open hearted way and want to use this as a teachable moment for somebody who almost in the way of somebody who may never have met like a gay person to their knowledge back in the 70s and 80s may have never met like a childless person before. And so this is the time to be able to go, actually, you know, this is an interesting thing. So. Uh, for me, I have some explainers about, you know, what a difficult process it is. And if I'm, again, feeling the right emotional energy, I will say, do you know what? That's absolutely something that we explored. And we went a reasonable way down the path. But um, given everything that we'd been through, we just simply didn't have the energy to pursue it further. Bearing in mind, we'd already had this huge, huge journey behind us. Um, but it's something that friends of ours have done and friends of ours are doing which is absolutely wonderful but again it's it's not as simple as just doing anything and I think having those like little sort of explainers in your back pocket again for when you're feeling like you have that energy there is really crucial um a second thing is that on the nature of acceptance itself this isn't just going oh I've accepted I'm never going to have kids now everything's fine la 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 that's not it at all. It's, I think acceptance is a real, it's self work. It's something that is an ongoing piece of work through our lives. And sometimes like a wound or like, like stupidly, I cut off the end of my finger with a mandolin in like 2020 and it took months to heal. It was so painful. And even now I occasionally like bang it and go, oh, that's really, oh, and that's exactly the same sort of metaphor for me as me not having kids. Like sometimes I'll be talking about Christmas and I'll really grumpily go, no, I don't like Christmas Day. I'd rather just spend it at home with us. And or I'm like, oh, that really. And it reminds you that like, I think like Jodie Day possibly puts it in her book that though this huge wound that for a really decent period of time is basically there it does heal but it's never going to go away because that is a scar so it's just sort of so I'm getting notes that my internet connection is getting unstable so sorry if I disappear but just to remember that that is something that is with you like any form of grief 
Um, but particularly a disenfranchised grief like this one, one that isn't really recognized by society. So that acceptance is not just about our situation. It is about us as fully rounded people. And for me, that is something that is so important to remember. Like, yeah, I'm childless, not by choice. Um, but I don't necessarily identify as that because to me, that is a facet of cat in the same way as all the other things good bad random like completely cuckoo all of that sort of thing it's all part of the mixing pot that makes us a human being and that is such an important thing to remember what on and it's unfortunate i've got to sort of call an end to this sort of webinar in the next few minutes but i agree that i'm childless i'm not ashamed of that it's a little bit of me it used to be there when i was grieving it was there but it slowly moved away and it went around and it's gone behind. And not, I'm not afraid to say childless because I'm not child free. I didn't make the choice. I would have been a mum if I'd had the option. So I'm childless because yes, the child I wanted in my life is not there, but it doesn't make me a less of a person or less of anything. It just means, like you say, it's a bit of my heart that will always be missing, will be empty because the children I didn't have. It's owning the word and not letting it own me. So I've got one more thing to do tonight, but before I do that, I want to say thank you to all of you for coming tonight and expressing some really positive things that I think everybody is going to take away and think about and hopefully give them a little bit of peace of mind or something they can refer back to in the future. So thank you for that. But for the last thing tonight, I'm bringing the candle back. The match has gone out again. Our first dream went out, but it doesn't mean we can't have new dreams. Hey, I knew I'd go again. It doesn't mean that we can't look at that light and see the future, see the light, see the brightness, see our community, see our strength, our wisdom, and everything that is powerful. God, blimey, here we go. And wonderful about us as unique individuals. So I want to say thank you for being here throughout the week and tonight. All of you again and all of you there. And I'm just going to leave it and cancel, cancel, close down this webinar with this candle burning in front of me to remind me of you. And I'll keep this alight tonight to say how wonderful and how much love I feel from you. God blimey, I'm really going... <laughs> But I'm not afraid to show my tears because that is part of who I am. And that's what I want you to be able to do is to show who you are and be proud of who you are. Never be ashamed and never hide behind your light. So thank yeah. you. Happy love. tears. Happy tears. <laughs> yeah, thank oh, you. They're, happy tears. they're tears full of love. And that's what I'm giving to this community. Yeah. So with that, thank you. I love you. And I'm still here for you.